Okay, so uh, Tomer has kindly agreed to give a talk in the seminar on ambidextry or ambidexterity in chromatic homotopy theory. All right, so take it away, Tomer. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, let me add one more get technical remark. So um, I, I have an unusually bad handwriting, um, as anyone who's seen me uh, give a talk ever knows. Uh, so please don't be ashamed to tell me. I'm trying, I'm tr I'll try to be as clear as possible but, and write very large, um, but uh, this is also, you know, unconventional medium. So please, uh, if there's any questions, uh, let me know. Okay, so um, let me start by saying that Anything uh, new that I'm gonna uh, tell you today is a joint work uh, in progress uh, with uh, uh, Shahar Karmeli and Lior Yanovsky. Um, and um, um, yeah, so hopefully some of it is going to be on the archive at some point, but you know, um, in the current situation, you never know uh, when things will happen or maybe not only in the current situation. So I'm, I'm going to start by giving um, a kind of introduction to uh, chromatic homotopy theory. Now, um, I, th I think many of you heard um, introductions to chromatic homotopy theory, and there, there was a really, really cool one that David gave in this seminar uh, last week. But um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a slightly different perspective, so um, uh, bear with me for a moment. So. You know, so, so chromatic homotopy theory um, is an approach to the to, uh, can be thought of as place as, a, as an approach to the study of the infinity category of spectra. So we have this 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 wonderful infinity infinity category spectra, and it's a symmetric monoidal uh, infinity category, and it has a very very interesting unit known as the sphere spectrum, and um, the perspective uh, that um, um, this would be the most uh, useful in the point of view I'm going to present right now, is that spectra are the homotopy theorist abelian groups. So there's a, there's a very nice category known as the category of abelian groups. It is also has a monoidal structure, symmetric monoidal structure. And there's, a, there's also a unit which is also uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, people have been uh, talking about it for many years called the integers. And um, and the idea is that this is this is this is you know in some sense spectra are the infinity abelian group in in a way that I'm I'm I'm, I'm not going to um, make precise. Let's just expect expect um, um, accept this as a as an assumption. And so now, if we if you want to you know if we want to if we look at the abelian groups, um, so there's so you know um, um, algebra geometers. Um, have a very, very uh, complicated way to describe uh, the simple category of abelian groups. So abelian group, you, you learned about them, you know, in, in, I don't know, uh, first year of undergrad, but, but an algebraic geometer will tell you that those are the quasi-coherent sheaves on the spectrum of the, of the affine scheme, which is the spectrum of the integers. Um, of the integers. Um, now, this, is, this, is, this seems to be an awfully, um, complicated way to write down the abelian groups. There's definitely much more letters on the right than there are on the left. But um, um, this tries to tell us some kind of a story. And the story is that abelian groups can be thought of as, as something that lives over some space. And we can try to understand abelian groups by uh, trying to kind of decompose uh, our abelian group fiber-wise and then glue it back together, some kind of a divide and conquer perspective. And, and this topological space, uh, the spectrum of Z, is, is, is actually very, very simple. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's one special point, the generic point, uh, which is known as zero. And then uh, there, there's closed points, um, one for every uh, prime number. Right, so, um, so another way to uh, describe this, this complicated formula uh, is that um, abelian groups uh, can be uh, somehow better understood if they're first decomposed into um, primary phenomena, one, primary in the sense of one for every prime, and then we uh, try to glue the information back together. And, and, and one perspective on chromatic homotopy theory 
is the attempt to do a similar thing for spectra, to try to find how to decompose it into uh, phenomena that are in separate par primes and then try to glue the information uh, hopefully back together. Now, um, th so the question is, what are those primes that appear? And um, for this, you need to start doing some kind of a thought experiment. And the thought experiment is that you, you grew up on some faraway island in which you, you have learned enormous amount of category theory and maybe even infinity category theory, uh, but you have never heard of the prime numbers. Um, of course, this faraway island, I mean by Australia probably, and, um, and you, you need to rediscover them by uh, looking at this uh, infinity category of spectra. So how would you do such a thing? Well, um, so let's again go back and, and kind of meditate on, on our um, early mathematical education. And one of the first thing we learn about abelian groups is the, is the primary, the composition theorem. And the word prime is somehow in the title. So this, this seems to be like a good lead. And it tells us that um, if we have, so among abelian groups, we have kind of um, the finitely generated abelian groups. And, and if we have the finitely generated abelian group, uh, we know that it looks like some copies of R and some uh, product of, um, of, you know, of uh, Ri and you know, P1, R1, P2, R2, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so it decomposes into cyclic groups uh, um, and each of them of some prime power order. And here we have primes. Uh, so that, that's, that's fairly ex uh, exciting. How would our friend the um, uh, the algebraic geometer will 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 say this? Well, first of all, he would say that the finitely generated abelian group is a coherent uh, sheaf on spec C, but that's somehow not very interesting. The point is that he would say that um, um, in a finitely generated abelian group has a support, and the support is some subset of this space. And you can ask, given a prime and, a, and, a, and an abelian group, if it's supported or not supported on this prime. And this is, this is something that can be um, attacked um, categorically uh, pretty, in a pretty convenient manner. Um, so because, and, and the, the idea is, uh, is to do the following thing. You're, you're, you're asking yourself, well, let's say that I have some prime in spec of the sphere spectrum, which is the thing we're kind of trying to compute here. And, um, and I, you know, I don't know what the prime is yet, but I wanna talk about all, let's say, all uh, finitely generated spectra that are supported away from this prime, that are, that are, that are supported away from it. So, so first of all, I need to know what finitely generated is, but happily we know what finitely generated is in Australia. Finitely generated is the same as a compact object. So inside, so the finitely generated abelian groups are exactly the compact um, abelian groups. And we can talk about the compact spectra inside spectra. And now uh, we can try to look at categories, subcategories of that, which we want to think of them as all the objects supported away uh, uh, from a prime. And this, this, this subcategory is going to need to satisfy a couple of axioms. So first of all, we want P to be closed under um, finite limits, co-limits, and retracts. Okay, so it's somehow very intuitive to think that, you know, if, if, if on a given prime, my object, the fiber is zero, then any kind of construction that I can do uh, that build new things out of things that are zero there, I'm gonna stay zero all the time. So finite limits, finite co-limits, um, and retracts gonna keep me zero here. And the second axiom is that A, so if I have A and B, so A tends or B, ah, A tends or B is in P, if and only if, a is in P or B in P. Okay. Those are the two axioms. And the idea is that if I have a fiber of a point and I, you know, I, I think that I have some kind of a family 
and I'm looking at the point, the only way in which if I multiply two things, I'm gonna get something which is zero if, if it's one of them is zero. That's, so, um, so then I can now um, define those to be the primes rather than, um, um, you know, now it's, now it's my definition of a prime is this category of things which are supported away from the prime. And, um, and this, this, um, this can be justified uh, by, so this, this, this can be justified by a theorem of Hopkins and Neiman that says that um, um, actually, if instead of the uh, category of spectra, you're gonna take the category of, um, of, you know, of, of, of quasi-coherent complexes of quasi-coherent sheaves on some scheme under some assumptions, then this will actually generate the scheme back again. And this, this, this entire perspective was, was kind of axiomatized by Balmer. So this is known as the Balmer spectrum. But I, I, I'm, I'm not interested in the generality. I really care about only about spectra. So I can ask what is the picture that I'm gonna get if I'm gonna run this process, if I'm gonna just look at those uh, primes. And let me go back. So th this, was, this was my picture of spec of Z. And I left a lot of room and I did it on purpose because it turns out that all of those primes in some sense are still there, but there's a lot of new primes. Um, so there's, uh, there's, there's kind of in every, every one of those classical primes becomes a column, an infinite column, uh, this is this color is not very good. Um, an infinite column, uh, which is so those becomes two infinity, three infinity, five infinity, etc. And here I have three one, three two, three three, three four, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, this other number, this other integer that starts at one and, and, and can become infinity, is known as the height. Of the problem. Um, and we can also use this um, perspective to understand um, um, the topology of this space uh, by asking ourselves what does it mean, uh, how, how you can reconstruct the topology of, um, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, let's say, of a scheme by the theory of support of finitely generated modules. And, and, and the topology is that, that, that th those arrows are arrows of specialization. So you should Think about this is a generic point, this is a slightly less generic point, slightly less generic point, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. And this is, uh, this is a, very, um, um, uh, a very, very pleasant picture. Um, and, 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 and now you can really try to use it uh, to do some kind of divide and conquer strategy uh, to attack spectra. So what do I mean by that? Well, um, I can, so, okay, so first of all, let me, let me for a moment consider only the case, instead of spectra, I can kind of, you know, I can restrict myself, oh, let me go back to, um, so instead of spectra, I can restrict myself to one classical prime um, and localize at it, which just means that I'm throwing away, I'm just, this is the process of restricting myself to one of those primes, so one of those columns. Um, somehow the process of gluing this information back together is fairly simple. And, um, and now, um, um, what can I do here? Well, I have this picture, so I have zero, and then, then I have P1, P2, P3, dot, 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 right? And I have P infinity somewhere up there. And I am, what I want to do is I want to decompose my spectrum um, um, with respect to different primes and then glue the information uh, back together. But the, the fact that the topology behaves, looks like this, um, what, it, what it actually means, if you look at support theory, it means that the corresponding categories of being support, so, so, ah, sorry. So, you know, so we have some, some subcategory P0 inside P local spectra compact, which corresponds to this, uh, which are the things that, that are away from zero. And then we have a subcategory P1 that are things that are supported away um, from P1. And the fact that um, this specialized here exactly corresponds to the fact that the inclusion goes in the other way. Um, so, 
um, yeah, if you think about it, um, um, in, in the case of abelian groups, for example, right? So being, being away, in the case of abelian groups, right? So um, uh, being, let, let's say that I'm looking at, I'm sorry, ah, let's say that I'm looking at P local abelian groups, okay? So um, abelian group, uh, so, and I take a finitely generated one, then uh, being, being supported away from zero is exactly being torsion. And being supported away from the prime P is being zero. Because if I have a finitely generated, this is Nakayama, if I have a finitely generated module over ZP, which if I tensor it with FP is zero, ah, if M is finitely generated over Z localized P, and M tensor FP is zero, then M is zero. So, um, so this means that 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 the inclusion go the other way, the other way. So being 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 supported away from FP in particular implies being torsion. So being supported away P zero. So so this inclusion goes this way, um, and I can um, restrict myself to everything below a certain line by taking the category of spectra, P local spectra, and kill this PN. And I can kill further so PN minus one. This is this is gives me some kind of a filtration. And trying to study things for a given prime, is I can just look at the fiber of this of this functor. So I, I, I have those are two infinity categories, and I take I can take everything that goes to zero. And I can so I can look at the fiber. Um let's call it I N. And I n is an infinity category. It's a stable infinity category. It also has a symmetric monoidal structure that comes from, from this. And, and, and it, it is, I am going to denote it by here because it's equivalent to what is classically known as the telescopic localization of spectrum. Okay? So this is, this is kind of a piece of the story that you get. Um, now, Okay, so that's all uh, nice and well, but um, 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 so so we got we got we got pretty far. We have this chromatic picture, and we know how to decompose our infinity category spectra and find little pieces that hopefully going to be simpler. And um, but there, there but there's an entirely different way um, to try to do this reverse engineering process of going from uh, from primes. Uh, from the category of spectra um, back to, um, you know, spec of the sphere. There's a different perspective you can take. So let me say something about this other perspective that you can take. So, so I was saying that, you know, I was kind of trying to see where in abstract mathematical training primes appear early on, and they appear in the primary decomposition theorem. Um, this is a place when they appear in abstract algebra, so you can hope to use this perspective to invent uh, a way to talk about prime abstractly. But they actually appear even earlier. They appear when you study linear algebra. So when you study a lin your linear algebra class, uh, you learn that if you take um, a skew field, F, skew field, then, it has a characteristic. And this characteristic is either zero or it's a prime number. So here's another question you can ask. Well, maybe I can use this perspective to define, um, to define the notion of, of a prime. I, I'm gonna talk about characteristics of skew fields or something known as division algebras. Um, well, for that I need to do a few things. So first of all, I need to know, um, I need to be able to talk about skew fields and the skew fields are, are kind of associative rings. So I need to know that, that I know what associative rings are in this category, um, but that's fine, right? Because I have a monoidal structure. 
So I can just decide that it's an associative monoid in here. So that, that's, a, that, that, that's fine, that's, that's a ring. And now I need to somehow identify that it's a skew field among all rings. Well, one possible definition would be that every element which is different than zero is invertible. But I just lost my game because I used the word element, which is not a very well behaved one when you think infinity categorically. So, um, so that, that's, that might not be that great. But there's another thing that you learn about skew fields in linear algebra class. You learn in every module over them has a basis um, or, you know, it's, this, is, this is linear algebra. So, um, so, um, so you, and, and in fact, it's easy to see that that's exactly characterization. You have a, if you have a ring and there's a in, non-invertible element in it, you can divide by this element and that's, that's not a free module over R anymore. It doesn't have a basis. So, so those exactly classify the skew fields, those that have, uh, that every module over them is free. And you can use this characterization. And now you can say, okay, fine. So I know what skew fields are in spectra. And now I need to um, see what their characteristic is. And those are gonna be my primes. Well, this might sound a little bit circular because I need to, you know, I said, I wanna ask what the characteristic is. And I didn't say um, that that's already a prime, which I didn't define, but now you can kind of use a hint from the history of, uh, of logic and math. And you know, but when like in the end, end of the 19th century, uh, Frege was trying to define the notion of a number. So you know, how do you define the notion of a number before you, have the, before you have it? And his idea was, well, first we can define when two uh, sets have the same number of elements. This is when there is a bijection between them. That's, known as the Hume principle. And then once we define this, this is an equivalence relation. So a number can be just the equivalence class of all sets of the same size. And we have a notion of being of the same size, which we don't need for it already having a notion of a number. And that's, that idea can work here because um, um, if we have two division algebra, D1 and two, two, D2, two skew fields, um, they have the same characteristic. This is not hard to verify. If and only if D1 tensor D2 is different than zero. Now, note that um, this is not immediately obvious that this is an equivalence relation, but it is. Um, it's not very hard, but it's not immediately obvious. Um, it's an equivalence relation. And the equivalence classes exactly corresponds to uh, prime numbers in zero. So we can run the same process in spectra and, and use this definition. And we get a new definition of what is a prime. And we can ask what is the picture we're gonna get. And here's something extremely, extremely, extremely encouraging. We get the exact same picture. Now, that is, that is very positive, right? So, and, and so first of all, you know, that's very encouraging. That means somehow, you know, we had two perspectives of what are prime numbers um, and they, and they converge to the same picture. And I should mention that the fact that you get the same picture is extremely hard theorem. It uses basically the entire power of the nilpotence theorem, which is, you know, possibly the, you know, the, the, the biggest kind of, uh, the, 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 the strongest uh, uh, engine in the heart of chromatic homotopy theorem. Um, so this is a highly non-trivial statement. Never, nevertheless, it is true. Um, so you're, you're getting very excited. And now you're, but, but, but wait, um, you can also try to ask this other perspective. How, how, you know, how would you decompose um, your spectra into pieces? And in this case, there, there's, there's an even easier, possibly, answer to that. Well, you can just say, you know, if I have a division algebra, D, Right? And I want, I want to kind of specialize into it, into its characteristic. I can do the following thing. I can look inside spectra on A, well, let's just call it D, or maybe F because it's a, you know, it's a skew field, F. Okay, so F is skew field in spectra. And I can define AF in spectra to be 
all the x in spectra so that the x tensor f is zero. So this is being supported away from f. And this set and and this set depends only on the characteristic, which already is quite positive. So if you have two skew fields of the same characteristic, this 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 subcategory is the same one. And then you can just quotient like you can declare all of those objects to be zero. And you know, so those are the f local objects. And uh, um, and 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 you can run this process here and ask, you know, what happened when you use the, you know, what happened when you use some, some, you choose some skew field that correspond to some, to some prime, to some chromatic prime Pn. So it is very customary in the field to suppress the prime P, thinking that you chose it once and for all. So this is why the, the notation for this is, is, is doesn't use P and it's denoted by SPKN. So that's, and you get another symmetric monoidal stable infinity category, and it's um, and it and you can um, fully faithfully embed it in SPTN. Um, in fact, in fact, um, um, there's there's a and there's a and this is a limit preserving adjunction, and there's a left adjoint, which is a localization. In fact, even something um, kind of uh, stronger, it's true. Uh, you can define, you can look at the unit of this category as living inside SPTN. And SPKN is just modules over this unit inside SPTN. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a ring that being a module over it is, a, is fully faithful inclusion. It's uh, it's uh, this follows from the fact that it's an idempotent algebra. If you tensor it over the unit, you can look at it. This is it's itself. Um, so it's a very nice embedding of, of of a category. But here's here's the only place where this very nice story gets a maybe a little bit set turn. We don't know that those two perspectives, although we know that the two pictures. Decomposing into primes are the same pictures. We don't know that the that the, that the pieces that we get are the same pieces. Uh, this is this is the content of the telescope conjecture. Uh, we know it for n equals zero. That's essentially trivial. Uh, for n equals one, it's already non-trivial, and it's a theorem by Mahold and Miller. And uh, for n equal two and above, it is not only not known but conje conjectured to be false by by many experts in the field. Uh, but in any case, uh, we don't know. Okay, so so that's that's somehow um, that that is somehow a mystery. Um, and between those two ones, so th this one somehow has more information in it uh, because it's larger. You know, it remembers more. Remember, I have a quick question, uh, if you can hear me. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, I was wondering how structured the the fully faithful functor from uh, can local to TM local spectra is. Um, so it's 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 the it's the it's the inclusion. So it it can be thought of as the forgetful functor from a category of modules. Um, I'm not sure if this is answering your question, but it's it's uh, it's so it's a uh, it's it's uh, over over this kind of idempotent algebra so it's uh, it's it's fully faithful and it's both limit preserving and co-limit preserving it has both right adjoint and left adjoint um it is not um, um it is not a symmetric monoidal because the unit well we don't know if the unit goes to the unit if the unit goes to the unit then the telescope conjecture is true uh but it is um um i guess you can say oidal so if you if you if you tensor two things uh, it's non-unital symmetric monoidal. I'm not sure if that's answering the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, is there any other question? I don't know. I have been speaking for a while. Okay. So um, okay. So so, but we definitely know more about this one. 
um, in general. That's 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 one. Th this is the one that 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 we know a little bit more about. And and at least one reason for that is also something that you can kind of um, uh, picture, think about um, in analogy analogy with algebraic geometry. Um, so you know somehow part of the kind of story of scientific advancement is that you start with things that are, are kind of simple in the sense that they're 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 common and 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 and, and, and you know basic to our lives um, and you replace um, um, the notion of what what is really simple by things which seem a little bit more foreign but 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 they're they're they're, they're exhibit a more pure phenomena you know it's kind of you know like the, the first chemists you know, they thought they were trying to understand, I don't know, wood and fire and water. And then, you know, then people realize, oh, there's molecules. So that's a, that's a simpler thing. Oh, there's atoms, there's electrons, there's protons. So those are things that are farther away from our experience, but they are in some sense behave in a way which is maybe more structured and easier to analyze and have kind of a nicer, um, um, uh, um, the, the smaller complexity of description. And, and this reductionist point of view is, of course, all, also true in math. So, so, he, so I already kind of did something like that. You know, I started with the integers, which are something, you know, that, that, that every kid knows. And I was kind of telling you, oh, but, you know, we know that actually this field SP of modular, modular arithmetic is actually simpler than this one. You know, we, we kind of think about that as a family that, that is built out of this thing. And, and this is simpler, although it's, you know, maybe a little bit more abstract, but in some sense has pure and simpler behavior. Um, and in fact, we know that, that there's an extra step to that. This is a field, but there are fields which are simpler than other fields. Those are algebraically closed fields. And this is already an infinite structure, uh, but, uh, but, 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 you know, its behavior is even simpler. You know, we can say uh, more uniform statements about algebraically closed fields. And they tend to have simpler theory. And then, you know, uh, the way we go from our different primes back to Z is by this, this thinking about spec Z as a space and gluing things back together. But there's also a way to go back and forth from here to here. There's a Galois group. In this case, it's a Z hat um, acting on FP bar. So, you know, one, one thing that you learn when you start doing um, certain forms of arithmetic that if you have a question about the finite field is maybe a good idea to think about it over FP bar and try to add the Galois, and that maybe 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 going to make your question easier. And and one reason that we know more about the Kane local case is that we can do something similar. So so there's a notion of Galois extensions inside this uh, world of stable symmetric monoidal infinity categories, and um, and in this world, the Kane local sphere has some kind of an algebraic closure, which is called Morava Etiord. And it has an action. This, I'm sorry. This thing has an action by the absolute Galois group, and known as the Morava stabilizer group. And a lot of one of the main ways we attack questions about the Kane local world is that we move to the E to, 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 to modules over this EN and then try to use the sent back using 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 the action of this group. Um, in fact, so so you know so if you want kind of an analogy, so this is like I don't know this is like I don't know Q vector spaces. This is like Q bar vector spaces. Okay, so this is well this is like Q bar. Maybe I should say Q bar vector spaces. The category will be modules over this E N. The K and local category. Um, I'm going to denote Tom, this. Tom, I'm just, going to just say, Sorry. Just one second. I'm just going to say that I'm going to denote this category because I'm going to use it later by theta n. Yeah. Um, so I once heard before that uh, you should think of en as sort of the localization at the prime, uh, and then and then kn as sort of the uh, residue field. Uh, is is that right or or well, I don't, I don't want to say right or wrong, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say this. I wouldn't say this. I would, I, I think, I think, um, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, I think a better thing, I would find a better thing to say 
is that um, you know when you when you went to SPKN, um, it's maybe you know maybe you're, you're you're working in a kind of infinitesimal neighborhood, so you're not working in in vector vector spaces over your field, but rather with you know things which has you know it's like the difference between being an FP vector space and being a P torsion abelian group, right? You can have P squared torsion, P cube torsion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Mm. So in that sense, in that sense, I would say that you know the KN, the KN local is maybe some is maybe analogous to ZP because you know um, the unit of if you put a symmetric monoidal structure on P torsion abelian groups, which you can, um, uh, the unit is going to be the natural monoidal structure on it, the unit is going to be ZP, it's going to look like ZP. And then um, and from this perspective, EN is going to be the V vectors of FP bar. So it's the maximal Galois extension of something which is actually not a field, but rather, you know, it's, it's kind of, you take the maximal Galois extension of the thing that you have, but, but there's, there's kind of an infinitesimal thickening um, to it. Um, arbitrary infinitesimal thickening. I think that's a better picture to have in mind if you want to be a little bit more precise than I was. Is that is that help, is that helping? Yeah, I was just wondering. Um, e n is an e infinity right. ring, though, right? Yes, and uh, k n is not. Yeah, that okay. is true. So yeah, so k n in this picture supposedly is f p in this analogy, but in this analogy, but it's a slightly a issue here, right? It's it's somehow um, because because you know this is the, but those those two things are are kind of commutative rings. While well, this is this thing is only a skew algebra, a skew field. So in that sense, you know, it doesn't behave as, sim as simple as you, simple as simply as you might wish. Because that that's the case. Other questions? Yeah, this is Aaron Mazel G. I have a follow up question on that. Um, yeah. Do you know if are are there commutative? Uh, Algebras in in every uh, equivalence class. I mean, you, you defined characteristics to be equivalence classes of skew fields, and yeah. of course, you know that's because Moravec K theories are are not commutative. In general. Um, but are there commutative? No, there can't. There can't be. Um, um, there can't be. So that if you if you demand them to be commutative, the only you're going to get back only the characteristic those that you had for Spexy. You're going to get Q and FP. Um, okay. That's um, it, it's um, uh, it's 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 a very big hammer to put on it, but if you want one way to get it is from the May conjecture. Um, it tells you that if you have an infinity ring, and it's um, it's 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 both rationally trivial and and it's if it's if it's H Z trivial, so it's if rational trivial and H of P trivial, then it's zero. So this ah, means okay. that if you had anything in the middle which is an infinity ring and and it's not in one of those, it has to die. Okay, so it's not just the Moravec K theories themselves that were problematic. It's the entire uh, idea of asking for commutativity. Yeah, yeah, you, you can't you can't have that. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, okay, so so this is this is you know so 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 some some part of the reason why you know people were you you know you would find more papers on the archive on on the K and local category rather than the T and local category has to do with the fact. That you can work with this thing, which is behave simpler, and then use, you know, descending using the action of this of this group, and this is how you you're 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 gaining information on this. Um, so here now, I'm ready to tell you, as a first approximation of what is the first result I want to tell you about, and yeah, which is that uh, we construct Galois extensions. Of SPT. Okay, so that's that's the thing. That's one of the things that I want to tell you, or maybe the main thing I want to tell you. Is we know how to construct Galois. Now we don't know what the Galois closure is, and we don't know what the Galois group is. So um, it's not like you know, in some sense, we're not in the situation we got all the way up and we understand the situation entirely. But uh, we at least can can kind of make things a little bit simpler than there. In some sense, you know, we can we can unwind it a little bit, and and I want to and I want to so so to 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 explain you 
uh, this result, um, I want to do uh, now two things. So the first thing I want to tell you, I want to tell you what is somehow the definition of the Galois extension um, in this abstract world, because I, I want my, my, my theorem to be a little bit more concrete. Um, and then after that, I'm going to start telling you how we construct it. And the construction is going to be a very strongly related to a quite interesting uh, categorical property that these categories have. Uh, which is uh, known as infin uh, in infinity semi-additivity or ambidexterity, which is hence the ambidexterity in the name of the talk. So, what are Galois extensions? So, this is this is a, this is a very nice definition uh, due to Rognes. Okay, so this is this is this is a uh, this is definition by Rognes, and um, so the idea is that you have some stable infinity category C, and you have some ring R in it, so a commutative algebra in it. Um, with an action of some finite groups. I'm going to write it this way now. So G is a finite group. So we say that R is a Galois extension, G Galois extension of the unit of C if, so one, two, Three, there's three conditions. So the first one is that um, the uh, you, the map from the unit to the fixed points of the action is an equivalence. The second condition is so you take two copies of R, you tensor them together, and you map it to a product of G copies of R. And you know, I'm not going to formally write this map, but the way you should think about it is sending x tensor y to the x times g acts of y for g and g. Okay, so in the g coordinate, uh, in the you know, in the coordinate corresponding to the trivial element of g, I just multiply, and in the in in, in, in another coordinates, I, I first apply g to y to one to y my second coordinate. You can make this definition formal. And the third one is that the functor from C to C, which is tensoring with R, is conservative. So if something goes to zero, it was already zero. Okay. Uh, actually, Rognes calls this a faithful Galois extension. Um, uh, but all the, I, I'm, I'm going to be interested in the faithful situation, so let's just call it Galois extension. Okay. And uh, so this is this is this is this is Rognes's definition, and um, and um, hey, Tomer, you know, yeah, this is Clark Barrick. Um, hi, hi. Uh, what kinds of G are you going to allow here? I am going to allow uh, finite groups G, and and um, and but you, you may be uh, suggesting that I, I should be able to allow more general G and you're right, but I'm not going to do it in your talk, in this talk. Okay, great. Um, so, um, um, okay, so um, there's a, and, and now I'm going to, so I am going to generalize just one bit, so if, G is a profinite group. Okay, I'm going to define a G Galois extension. Um, the following, so G, so here I'm again being informal, but I think the idea would be clear. G is uh, is you know it's some system of groups G I, right, and what, what I will mean by that is that for every i, I have some ri, which is a gi Rognes Galois extension, and that um, you know I have if I have a map from gi to gj in this diagram, I have a map back from ri to rj, which is equivariant, and if I take the fixed point by the kernel of this map. This is an isomorphism. So 
basically what I'm saying is I have a, you know, I have a compatible system of Galois extensions. That's, that's what I, okay, this is kind of a compatibility. Okay, so now I can uh, say uh, that what we construct, we're going to construct uh, Z hat sine times ZP star Galois extension of SPTM. That's what we're going to do. Okay, so this is an abelian group. So we found we found some some abelian abelian uh, um, um, we found some abelian uh, extension of the TN local. Okay, so uh, how I'm I'm how am I going to construct this? Well, there's um, let's 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 now go back. To classical algebra, and let's say that you're interested in constructing um, abelian extensions of Q. Well, um, there's, there's, we actually know what all the abelian extensions of Q are, and and those are the cyclotomic extensions. The cyclotomic extensions are are relatively uh, easy to describe. It's just adding to unity. So you're you're just trying to add a solution to the equation x to the m equals one for some m. Right? So that, that, that's essentially what you're doing. Uh, so let's, let's restrict ourselves to um, the case where m is a prime. Just gonna make part of what I'm saying a little bit um, simpler and then we're gonna generalize. So you wanna add p fruits of unity. So you know, um, you can, you, you're trying, so for every field you can try to add roots to the equation x to the p equals one. Now, you might think that, well, well, probably wouldn't think, but if maybe you're extremely not careful, you would say, oh, that's, that's my extension. Just add x to the p equals one, but that, that's, that's not quite right uh, because th there's a, there's an, there's, this, is, this, this, this polynomial is not, is not um, um, irreducible. It's already have has one root, which is the root one. Um, so I can I can I can put I can substitute one and get a map um, to f. And what happens if the characteristic of f is different than p? That I can I can actually show that this projection, this this map of ring, decomp. There's, there's a complement to it. There is another ring, which is the complement, such that this is a pro, such that the map from F, ah, it's not FP, it's just F, Fx mod Xp to the minus one, two F times E is an isomorphism, and E is exactly adding a p-fruits of unity, okay? And this works in characteristic, um, uh, it works in characteristic different P, it doesn't work in characteristic, characteristic P. Let me try to give a slightly different, um, so I, I don't, you know, writing down add, add a variable and quotient by an equation is something that doesn't fly very well in infinity world. So I, I wanna think about what I did here in a slightly different perspective. So what is, what is doing this? Well, this is not just any old ring. This is a group algebra. I have a cyclic group of P elements. And this thing is exactly just taking the group algebra of this cyclic group of P elements. And I have a map back from here to here that sends every element of my group to one. And what happens when the characteristic is different than P, that this map splits and I have this other component. Now a splitting of a ring is the same as finding an idempotent in this ring. And this idempotent can be described very simply. So the, the, the idempotent that I need in order to split this off is the sum of all the G in CP. 
divided by the size of CP. It's the average of all the elements. That thing lives, if the characteristic is different than P, this thing lives in this group algebra. It's an idempotent and it splits this group ring into S and the adding P fruits of unity. And you see exactly what goes wrong when you try to do it in characteristic P. You can't divide by the order of this group. That's exactly what fails. Uh, and indeed, it doesn't work, right? If I, if I do it in characteristic P, I just get that this map is as far from split as possible. It's, uh, it's, it's a nilpotent, nilpotent thickening. There's, there's the reading, you can't run away from this point. It's the only point in this, in this scheme, if you will, okay? So, um, I wanna try to use this perspective in order to construct extensions for the TN local sphere. That is my goal. Uh, because group algebras, I know how to do. Um, if I'm, you know, this is a, this is a symmetric monoidal stable infinity category. And therefore it admits a unique symmetric monoidal uh, functor from spaces that uh, preserves colimits. It sends a space to X tensor the unit. And because it is um, symmetric monoidal, uh, it can be upgraded to a functor. In fact, this is an adjunction. This, is, this can be, become an adjunction um, from community of algebras in spaces or in infinity spaces to community of algebras in the TN locals category. So this means that if I have a commutative monoid in spaces in the coherent sense, I can here, I don't know, let's call it M, I can take its group algebra. That, that is a meaningful construction, okay? Um, so that, so, so but, but I still need to see that I can add all the elements, I need to know that I can average all the elements along the group. Now, um, so, that doesn't sound very promising, right? Because um, if, if, you know, if we work in characteristic zero, we can um, divide by the order of, um, you know, we, we can divide by order and numbers, so we can divide by order of a group. But if we go back to those, to those, well, all the way to those primes, well, I didn't say a lot about them, but I can tell you that if you look, consider, you know, Essential, essentially spectra that are kind of supported only on one of those things um, are essentially their homotopy groups are P torsion or, you know, um, or they're, they're built out of things which their homotopy group would be P torsion. It doesn't, multiplication by, in particular, um, there's no object on, on, in these categories on which multiplication by P is an isomorphism. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, so um, taking quotient by P is a conservative functor. So th those are those are really it doesn't seem like you will be able to divide, and uh, but um, and it really seems like from from this perspective from from looking at homotopy groups, it really seems. So now let me kind of go back and write the picture again. I have, oh, I have you know I have this picture. I have zero and then p one and then p two and then p three, dot 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 dot, and then I have p infinity here. So if you believe, you know, looking at homotopy groups, it really looks like, like the big division here, you know, the two camps is this one in which P is invertible and this one in which P is not invertible, which is kind of torsion. But if you believe the topology, then, you know, this is infinitely far from here. And this is, this, this you know, this, this is closer. This is like the topology here kind of looks like, you know, this is, this is, this is one and this is half and this is one third and this is one quarter and you know, this is zero. It's like, it's becoming closer to closer to that, but in some sense, this is kind of infinitely far. Um, so, so maybe, you know, maybe you can believe this picture that tells you that in some sense, those categories are really much closer to this one than they are to this one. And it turns out that if you ask the correct questions, um, really remarkably, that's what happens. And, and this takes us to the, this property the TN locals category that we're going to use, which is infinity semi-additively, 
infinity semi additively t, t well never mind um, that 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 really makes it behave a little bit more like statistic zero and that one would be the thing that would allow us to construct those cyclotomic extensions so um, okay so some kind of I'm 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 gonna now say something about higher semi add uh, additivity like um, I think it's a good point to stop and ask if there's any questions. <clears throat> um, if the question is how did I get to be 37 without being able to say additively, that's a, that's not that's a, that's for the for the T-roll. Um, okay, so so what is the phenomena I'm I'm trying to describe? <laughs> Um, the the phenomena that I'm trying to describe is 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 we, so we're going to put it in a you know generalized infinity categorical perspective, but uh, we are uh, but I'm going to tell you kind of the kind of the, the first the, you know the kind of phenomenological situation like the first kind of I don't know double slit experiment the surprising thing that then you put it into a more general context, um, and this is this is the Tate vanishing. Okay, so. If you have, uh, if C is a stable infinity category, okay, um, then um, let's say that you have some object in C with an action of G, G is a finite group. Okay, so um, you can construct, you can look at the orbits, and you can look at the fixed points. Now, in general, you know, um, you know, one of them is kind of fortunate, one of them is the fixed point, uh, but you know that you're stable, so you know that you can add morphisms. And the fact that you can add morphisms gives you a map known as the norm map from here to here. Um, I'm not gonna define it formally, but let me give you another situation in which you can add morphisms, which is um, in, 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 you know, in the category of abelian groups. So let's say that you have an abelian group with an action of G. Anyway, we said that you know, spectra are kind of analogous to abelian groups. Um, so then, you can look at the coinvariants. I can look at the invariants. There's a very simple map. If I have, if I have an orbit, which is you know, kind of represented by some class x in A, you can take the sum of g and g, and g of g x, and that's clearly a fixed point. And it only depends on the orbitals. So it's it's a really a well-defined map known as the norm map. And you know, by 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 kind of meditating a little bit more functorially about what, what you did here, you can actually define it for any stable infinity category. And um, note that, for example, you know, if A is in fact a, a Q vector space, right? It's a uniquely divisible abelian group. Um, then this is in fact an isomorphism. Orbits and fixed points are the same for a finite group. The reason that you can you can write there's a there's a there's an inverse, very simple inverse. If you have a fixed point, just divided by the order of g, and then when you sum back, you go back to where you started. So that's that that's an isomorphism for Q vector spaces. And um, and uh, but but for FP, right? For FP, this is not true. So take like CP, the trivial action on FP. Right, and so the orbits and the fixed point both going to be FP, and this sum is going to be just the zero map. So as far as an is from an isomorphism, that can possibly be okay. Um, so okay, that's 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 the two cases you know in this world, and now you can maybe already guess what I'm going to say. Um, so so Greenlee, Hovey, and Sadovsky proved for SPKN, and Kuhn proved for SPTN that for every X, and I'm going to take Kuhn's version because we're interested in the SPTN. With the G action, this map is an equivalence. Right, so that, that's really remarkable. It really tells you that although there's no way you can divide by the order of G because you know, there's no division by it, it really behaves like you can in some sense. Um, it really behaves more like characteristic zero in that sense that it behaves like it is in characteristic P. And, um, and um, so this was, this, was, this was, as I said, proved by Kulinitz, obviously, for SPKN and by, for 
Kun for SPTN. And, um, and then Hopkins and Lurie um, looked at it and, and kind of put this, this phenomena in a very, very nice, more general perspective. And, um, and they said that this is in fact a form. So let me say kind of the, the, the motto, Tate vanishing. So this is called Tate vanishing because the cofiber of this map it's known as the Tate construction. So saying that this is an isomorphism is saying that this is zero. But I'm not going to. I'm not going to care about the cofactor. So, um, but anyway, so Tate vanishing is a form of higher semi. This other this other word word. Okay. So, um, so what does that mean? Well, so first of all, let me say what is semi additivity itself. Right? So before we talk about what a higher version. So, so we say that a category or infinity category, the proof is going to look exactly the same, is semi additive if one, there's a zero object. So, initial and terminal objects are the same, exist and are the same. And two, um, if you have some finite set of elements, the coproduct is the same as the product. Oh. It's the same as the product. And what do I mean by the same? There is a canonical map from this side to this side that you can write down. What is this canonical map? Well, to write and write down a map from the core product to the product, I need to give you a map from xi to xj for every i and j. If i equals j, I'm just going to take the identity uh, because you know, that's a special map from i to i. And if i is different than j, well, I need to give you a special map from xi to xj. You know, in the general category, I don't have such a thing. But luckily, I already prepared, and I had to have a zero object which means that I can map to it here and then compose here. So this is a zero. So you can think about it as kind of the identity matrix. There's ones on the diagonals and there's zero everywhere else. And I demand that this identity matrix would be an isomorphism. And uh, this, is a, this is a property of our category, or infinity category. It's already observed in categories that this property gives you a very interesting structure. It allows you to, it makes for if C is semi-additive, home in C from X to Y is always a commutative monoid. And how do you, how do you sum? Well, if you, you want, if, if you look at the product of those two sets, this is the same as home from X to Y times Y, which is the same as home from X to Y coproduct Y. And now you can fold Right, the product of y with itself has a map back to y. Right, so, um, sometimes known as the fold of the product. And that, that you can prove that this is a commutative monoid always. And this is why semi, um, uh, if, if those commutative monoids happens to be abelian groups, they are called, this category called, is called additive. Um, and and, and this, in, this, this thing works also for infinity categories, and then you get that home C from X to Y has a structure of an infinity monoid, uh, as infi infinity monoid in spaces or algebraic spaces. So that's, that's a very nice extra structure you get from something which maybe seem a priori quite mild. Okay, and so what, what is the relationship to Tate vanishing? Well, now you can look at these orbits, right? And these fixed points, that looks very much, so this, both of those conditions really looks like a limit and a co-limit being the same. Um, if you take the empty category and the empty functor, the co-limit is the initial object and the limit is the terminal object and you're demanding that they'll be the same. If you take A to be a finite set, and a functor from here to here, that's exactly like choosing a bunch of elements. And you're demanding that the coproduct, which is the co-limit, will be the same as the product 
which is the limit. And, um, and, the, and now you have a group, you know, a, a groupoid, BG, and you have a functor from BG to C. That's, that's exactly like an object with a G action. And you're asking the colimit would, uh, uh, would be the same as the limit. You constructed a map between them, and you asked the colimit would be the same as the limit. Now, how did you construct a map between those two? You constructed the map between those two because you could add morphisms. Again, I'm not explaining exactly why, but, but that's, that's the gist of it. So you can really do it in any semi-additive infinity category. So, um, so we get a, some kind of a hierarchy here. Right, because already here for finite sets, um, to be able to say what map I want to be an isomorphism, I needed to have that the first condition uh, would satisfy. Okay, so 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 the this is this is the beginning of an you know of a of a of an infinite iceberg, if you, it's top of an infinite iceberg. So so you really so 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 now you can generalize. So. Um, you define so uh, uh, space A is called pi finite if one pi zero of A is finite, two for every point in A pi k of A is finite uh, for all k, and three for every a in a, pi k of a is zero when k is large enough. Okay, so finitely many connected components, each of them only finitely many non-trivial non homotopy groups, each of those homotopy groups is finite. Okay, the sum of all homotopy groups on all connected components is a fine, it's finite. And, um, and um, the, the so, uh, so definition, an infinity category C is called um, N. So, okay. So, I'm going to define now an N semi additive infinity category and I'm going to do it by induction. So, every infinity category is minus two semi additive. This is by, by declaration. And um, we will say that an infinity category C, which is n minus one semi-additive, is n semi-additive if for every A pi finite such that pi k of a, a is zero for every k bigger than n, and a in a, so this is sometimes called as what's called n finite. The map, I'm gonna go back to her, I'm saying the map here, oh, and, and functor x from a to c, the map from the colimit in x to the limit in x is an equivalence. Now, why did I, it seems like finally in the definition I didn't use the fact that I'm n minus one semi-additive. So why did I use an induction? Well, the, the reason is that, that in order to write this map, I need n minus one semi-additive, which is exactly what happened before. So we get that being minus one semi-additive is just that, that this, 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 right? So, so minus one semi, so minus one, the minus one truncated spaces, spaces would satisfy this for minus one is all in the empty set. So I only need a map from the initial object to the terminal object. That one always exists and it's unique, so there's nothing to say. And being minus one semi-additive is saying that it's an equivalence, so that's being pointed. And now given that you're pointed, as we've seen, for every um, pi finite space for n equals zero, which is being a discrete finite set, we get this map and being zero semi-additive, which is the same as being semi-additive is asking this to be an isomorphism. Now we get this norm map that, um, um, that, 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 that compares the colimit with respect to a group with the limit to, to, with respect to the group 
And being one semi-additive, it's saying that this is an equivalence. So what Grimis, Hovis, Sadovsky, and Kuhn showed is that SPKN and SPTN are actually one semi-additive. And what Hopkins and Lurie proved is that um, SPKN is infinity semi-additive, which means that for every, this works for all pi finite spaces. Okay, so that's what they proved. And later, um, 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 Carmeli and Yanovsky and myself proved that in fact SPTN is also infinity semi, which is the property I'm going to use to construct in a moment the scale wax. Okay, so that that's 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 that was a very quick introduction to infinity semi additivity. Um, but what is the gist of what I want to say here? Well, uh, what I want to what I want to say is that um, you know semi additivity gave us the ability to add maps. So what does infinity semi-additivity give us? What kind of additional structure it gives us on the home spaces? Well, what does it mean that you can add maps? Well, it means that you, you, know, you, you have this space of maps. This is home x, y. And you have two points in it, maybe more. And you know how to kind of magically combine them together to become just one map, which is their sum. And what we're going to do, what we'll be able to do in the, in the infinity uh, semi-additive world is that for, if A is any pi finite space and it has a map to, from to home x, y, we will be able to sum it together. Now, because this is an, kind of an infinite sum, it's a sum over a space, not over a set, uh, I'm going to use the integral notation. So let me show you how it's done. It's very it's very simple. So a map A from ham to from F to home X Y is the same as a point in home X Y to the A, which is the same as home X to Y to the A by the definition of product. This is the same as home X co-limit over A of Y because of infinity semi-additivity. And then I can use the fold map once, once, once again, because it's a map from a co-limit to back to home x1. This construction is what I write as the integral. Okay, so this is very exciting. So here's a plan. Find a pi finite infinity group A, by which I mean, you know, something in C of the spaces, which is actually a group, not only a monoid, which is the same as, you know, if you want connective spectra or just pi zero being group. And consider the group algebra with the map of the unit and try to split it. Okay, but that's, that's, that's not, um, you know, we're not done yet because, it, you know, summing over the group, that's very nice that I have a large collection of groups that I can sum over, but, but that's not, you know, that wasn't the problem in the characteristic P case. I can still sum over the group of P elements. What I'm incapable of doing is averaging. I need to be able to, uh, I need to be able to divide by the order of the group. So first of all, I need to ask, what is the order of the group? How can I talk about the order of the group in this context? Well, you know, how do you get to, uh, um, how do you count a set? Well, you know, you go over each element of the set and you add one for every element you see. So, you know, the size of a set is the integral over the set of one, right? So. This is something I can, this is something I can uh, um, um, define using the, the structure I already have. Between every x and x in my category, I have the identity map. And I can take the constant family over the identity map of x. And I'm gonna get something I'm gonna denote by the size of x. It's a map. 
you can verify with respect to the definition that I gave, that if you take A to be a finite set and C a stable infinity category, this is just the multiplication by the size of A that, that you know and love from, you know, from, from, from working in the stable world. So, so what I want, I want A to be um, pi finite infinity group with size of A invertible. That's what I want. And uh, um, so, so in a moment I discuss a more general phenomena, but let me kind of, because I see you're already on your toes to know which one is going to be the lucky one. So we can take the end fold delooping of the cyclic group of P elements. This N is the same N as the height. And in fact, this thing is invertible on SPT. So I can take the group algebra of the NCP, have a map back to the unit, which is just correspond to the map to BNCP to one, to the point. And I can construct a map from the unit here, which is going to be my, the item potent that I want by taking the, by taking, you know, I have a map from BNCP to the, to, ah, to home the unit BNCP. This is just, you know, sending the point to itself in some sense. It's completely abstract. I don't know. This is, this is, this is the kind of an inclusion map, if you want. Um, if you want a point here is the same as a map from a point, the point in the space is the same as a map from the point to it, and then just apply this unit function. And then I can integrate over BNCP and divide by the order of BNCP, which is something that I can do TN locally. And this thing I'm going to denote by E is in pi zero of the unit BNCP. And E is indeed an idempotent, and it does split this thing into two algebras. Now, there's an action on this thing by Z mod, you know, by a group of P minus one elements, cyclic, I don't know, I'm gonna call it Z mod P star, acts on this thing because it acts on CP. This idempotent preserves the action. So this thing is commutative algebra. And um, um, this is indeed a Galois extension. Similarly, I can build a Galois tower. Um, I can take the way that I do this, so I don't, I don't want to get to all this, I don't have the time, but basically what happened is that you can look at the map from here to here, and I can construct an idempotent that splits it into a product, so that the complement is the primitive p to the k roots of unity, if you will, in some sense, extension, and this is indeed a z mod p to the k star Galois extension. Okay, so I don't have a lot of time left, but I want to tell you two last things about this. So one is, this is what I told you is how you construct your candidate for a Galois extension um, using this averaging technique. But there's another question, which is how do you prove that's a Galois extension? How do you verify this? Okay, so you know, verifying this requires checking, you know, if we denote this, but let's just do one of those examples. They're all done the same way. Verifying this requires checking things like, you know, R tensor R goes to the product over P minus one, C minus one over R is an isomorphism. 
question how do you check this kind of thing and um and, and for this we we, we use um a, a method or i don't know a trick an observation which we call nil conservativity so you have this localization functor you know, the left adjoint to the inclusion from the TN local category to the KN local category. Okay. Now here, you can actually compute stuff because of what I said about Morava, uh, Morava A theory, and because a lot of very smart people did a lot of computations already, um, and because this is this this side is also strongly controlled by the algebraic theory of formal groups, uh, which which David talked about uh, for, for whoever was. Uh, in the in the talk last week, uh, but anyway, it's it's a, it's a, it's a more computational accessible thing. So here you can check stuff. Um, so here is something that you would like to do. You would like to construct the object here, possibly using this same activity, and check the check the isomorphisms here. Now, that would work if this functor is conservative. But um, because, you know, then you know that if something go to an isomorphism, it was an isomorphism. However, um, saying that this functor is conservative because it's a localization, it's the same as saying that it's an equivalence, which is the telescope conjecture, which would make my entire story kind of mute. But there's a very nice observation, which is this functor, L, is conservative on dualizable objects. So if you have two dualizable objects in the TN local category, and you know, the corresponding, the localization and the map between them and localization, this is an, this is an equivalence, then F is an equivalence. In particular, the telescope conjecture is equivalent, for example, to saying that the KN local sphere is dualizable as an object in the TN local category. Um, so the nice thing is that all of those things that we constructed here can be shown to be dualizable also using infinity semi-additivity. Infinity semi-additivity gives you that computing certain co-limits over pi finite spaces takes a dualizable thing to dualizable thing. And we started with the unit, which is very trivially dualizable. So we stay in the dualizable realm. And therefore, we can check that this is a Galois extension in the KN local world. I'm going to uh, conclude by telling you, in some sense, which Galois extension. So, so this way, by the way, you get the ZP star extension that I mentioned. There's also the DZ hat extension. Um, sorry, ZP star extension. Um, there is kind of the p cyclotomic extension. There's also the Z hat extension. Uh, this one is actually not that interesting in some sense. This is done by adding cyclotomic extensions of characteristic, which is prime to p in which you can just define, divide by the order of the classical group, the classical construction just for you. So it just goes through, but it also doesn't really give you a lot of interesting information. You're kind of duplicating your spectra. It's, it's, it's kind of a direction in which the descent is not very interesting. Um, what I do want to tell you about this is that, um, you know, I have, a, I have this map, which is the symmetric monoidal map from here to here, which means, you know, this is the, which means that I have a map from the absolute Galois group of SPKN to the absolute Galois group of SPTN. Okay. Now we know now that there's a map from here. This is the theorem that I just told you from surjective map from here to ZP star times Z hat. That's um, that's essentially the content of the theorem that I told you. And we know that this thing is isomorphic to the Morava stabilizer group. So we get a map from here to here. You can ask what this map is. And this is the abelianization map. De facto through the abelianization, of course. This is an isomorphism. So really, um, if you will, all a billion Galois extension of the KN local sphere can be lifted to the TN local world. Um, now, um, once you have those extensions, um, okay, so okay, so there's a lot of cool things you can do with those extensions that I doesn't seem to have time to tell you. Like you know, once you have roots of unity, then you can start defining Kummer extensions, 
and Kumer theory works in this world, which is really cool. And also, you know, once you have roots of unity, then you can try to you do Fourier analysis, which also works, which is kind of cool. Um, but let me tell you something that we don't know how to make work, because that's, and, and just end there in a more pessimistic note. Um, um, one of the great things that, that you can do with extensions is descent. Now, all those finite extensions indeed satisfy descent in the sense that you can kind of go, you know, base change to them and then go back using the, the group. But you can take kind of the, you know, the maximal extension, the one that corresponds to all of this together. I call it R infinity. You can say, oh, can I now study things in the TN local category by work with modules over this and then go back with the group? And for this, to be able to do this, you need to know that tensoring with R infinity is conservative. Otherwise, you lost some information. And this is something that we still don't know. We know it in height one. Uh, of course, in height one, it's, it's kind of obvious because of the, the telescope conjecture is known to be true, but we have a direct proof that it's true at height one. <coughs> but we don't know it at other heights. I think I'm going to stop here. That was excellent, Tomer. Thank you. Uh, thank you.